All right. Welcome back to the Alcohol Tipping Point podcast. I am your host, Debbie Maisner, registered nurse, mom, and alcohol-free badass. And today I'm so excited to have Claire Pooley on. She is a New York Times bestselling author. She's a blogger, a speaker. She wrote the memoir, The Sober Diaries, The Unexpected Joy of Being Sober. And she also wrote the novel, The Authenticity Project. And she even has a new book coming out in May. So welcome, Claire. Thank you. It's so good to be here. And I love the way you introduce yourself as an alcohol-free badass. I think I'm going to start doing that too, if you don't mind. Do it. We're taking it back. We're taking the alcohol-free sober world back over. (laughs) Well, thank you. For those that aren't familiar with you, can you just give a little introduction about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm, uh, as you said, Claire Pooley. I I live in London, England. I have three kids and two border terriers. And um, I worked in advertising for nearly 20 years. A uh, long time, and then uh, I got to a point about um, uh, now, almost exactly seven years ago, when I realised that my alcohol um, consumption was completely out of control, and and I started as a way of therapy. When I quit, I started writing a blog called "Mummy Was a Secret Drinker." And uh, and that blog became a memoir and uh, called The Sober Diaries. And now I'm a full time novelist. So, yeah, my life has changed just you know, 360 degrees uh, since uh, since I quit drinking um, seven years ago. Oh, I, I love that. I, I was actually just rereading The Sober Diaries. It's one of my favorite, my top like quit lit books to recommend because it's so well written And it's funny and accessible and you have so many good nuggets in there. But I was reading this part where you were visioning yourself in the future accepting a book award for a novel. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my gosh, she did it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I do think back to that time because, yeah, that's the point in the book, I think, where I'm trying to. I'm trying to to uh, imagine my happy place as a sort of as a as a way of of meditating or trying to forget about craving alcohol. And my happy place was always picturing myself at the launch of of you know soon to be best selling novel and and uh, surrounded by friends and family. And it happened, which was wow. you know the most extraordinary thing. So so you know miracles do happen and dreams really do come true when you when you quit drinking. Oh, that I just love that. Um, so what in like in a nutshell, like what was your experience with drinking? Um, you know what? I have to confess that for many years I loved it. Um, mm-hmm. I I started drinking uh, when I was in my teens and um, I drank a lot when I was at university. You know, all the students did. And my, back in my day, I didn't know anyone who didn't drink. And, you know, getting drunk was par for the course it wasn't you know it wasn't frowned upon or 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 anything so um so I drank a lot at university and then there was also it was also the era of Bridget Jones and Sex in the City and Absolutely Fabulous and all my female role models seemed to drink huge amounts it was seen as almost like your feminist duty you know keeping up with the guys and and uh you know and and uh, holding your own so, um, and then I went into advertising, which was a hugely, uh, a, 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 you know, it was, it was an industry that sort of was fueled by alcohol. We had, we had a bar in the office. I had a huge expense account and I was expected to take clients out and, and, and wine and dine them, which I did copiously. Um, and, uh, and alcohol was, was everywhere. And I, I really, you know, I burnt the candle at both ends, as my mother would have said. So, you know, I worked hard and played hard and, um, and I, I drank more and more and more. And I think the problem is that you don't notice that your tolerance for alcohol gradually increases. So, you know, whereas at the beginning I'd be, I, by the time I drank half a bottle of wine, I'd be, 
really nicely drunk you know by the time I quit drinking I could drink a whole bottle of wine and it would hardly touch the sides so um, so by the time I got to my mid 40s I was drinking a bottle of wine a day um, sometimes two bottles if I was going out for, for with for dinner or to a party or whatever um, so it added up to about 10 bottles of wine a week which is a huge amount but you know, I didn't really think I had a problem because I was rarely drunk. Um, nobody said, nobody staged an intervention. I didn't do anything, you know, really dangerous or really reckless. Um, but I was slowly killing myself. So uh, by that stage, I was uh, two stone. That's 28 pounds overweight. Um, I was a terrible insomniac. I was anxious all the time I was a really bad mother you know my life was and I was completely stuck in a rut I, I my life had just stopped going anywhere and I finally came to realize that all of it was was because of alcohol yeah and and when you talk about like it being the norm I mean I bet even then like yeah you were drinking 10 bottles of wine a week but probably everyone else was too I certainly, I thought they were, um, and I, I think part of the problem is that when you're a really big drinker, you surround yourself with other really big drinkers mm. because they're the people that make you feel comfortable and they're the people that you think are like you and they're the people that you're drawn to. So, so you know, it was true that they, I knew a lot of people who drank just as much as me, but that was partly because those were the people I'd chosen. Mm. Um, you know, if I... If I met somebody at the school gates and they suggested a cup of tea rather than a glass of wine, I would have thought they weren't my kind of person and I wouldn't bother trying to make friends with them. I must have missed out on some brilliant friendships over the years just because I was, you know, I, I was driven by finding people who I thought would be fun. And to me at that time, that equated to drinking lots. That is so true. I remember I was like, uh, I wouldn't hang out with someone if they didn't drink or it was kind of my litmus test. Like you like wine, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. You're right. We're, we missed out. Well, how has your life changed since getting sober? We kind of touched oh. on it already, but wow, seven years now, almost. God, it's it's really hard to answer that question because it's more a case of what hasn't changed. Mm. So, you know, since then I've, uh, I've got a whole new career. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a much, I'm a much better mum. I'm a better friend. I'm a better wife. Um, because I don't, I, I don't, fly off the handle so much I'm more able to live in the moment I'm just a sort of I'm a more I'm a calmer more empathetic person I think than I I was back then um and I have more energy you know I I get out of bed at, at five o'clock in the morning I mean that's how I I wrote two novels because um I write between five and eight in the morning before the kids get out of bed and I never could have done that in the old days. For sure. Um, <laughs> so, and, you know, I'm much healthier. So I'm a, I'm a normal weight now. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, uh, yeah, I just feel, I feel so much healthier than I ever did before. I don't think, and people tell me I, I don't, I, I look younger than I did then as well. I mean, alcohol is like free Botox. <laughs> <laughs> Because I mean, I actually I, I quit when I was forty six, and um, and I think I look like younger now, seven years later than than I did then. Yes, I I can see her, and she's glowing, and her, your skin is fantastic. Wow. Oh, you're kind. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that you just got back from a tropical vacation, um, and I wanted to hear how that, like, how your vacations are being alcohol free, and and how this last one was. Oh, that's that's really interesting because the, I went on I went to one of those all inclusive hotels oh, in the Caribbean, wow. where you know you pay a set price and then all your food and drink is free, which meant that there were people drinking cocktails around the 
24 seven. Um, and actually there was one moment where it was Valentine's day and they, the waiter came up with this really nice looking fruit drink and, um, you know, said happy Valentine's day. And I said, thank you. And I took the drink and I took a big slug and it had, it had Prosecco in it. Um, and, and it was the first time I'd had a, a, you know, a gulp of alcohol for, you know, for, as I said, seven years. Um, and, and I just hadn't expected anyone to serve me alcohol at breakfast time. <laughs> you know, it was eight o'clock in the morning. I don't think it was even eight o'clock. I think it was 7.30. Um, so, uh, so that was a bit of a shock. Um, but, uh, but actually I couldn't in the old days have imagined going on holiday and not drinking because holidays were when you just allowed yourself to break the rules and drink as much mm -hmm. as you wanted to and drink at any time of day. And, and now I look back and think, God, I wasted so many amazing holidays just feeling hung over all the time and getting up really late and, you know, getting to the point in the evening where you can't remember all of it very clearly. And um, and I come back from holiday and need another holiday to recover from the holiday that I just had. Whereas now, um, you know, my holidays, I bounce out of bed really early, feeling energetic. I make the most of the day. I remember all of it. I come back with feeling refreshed. Um, and, you know, when I'm given that I always have the kids on holiday with me, um, I think it's much better for them as well, because I'm not begrudging spending time with them. I'm really enjoying it. I'm not thinking, God, I've got a terrible headache and I wish the children would, would stop bugging me to do X, Y, or Z, you know, which is what I would do in the old days. So, you know, alcohol-free holidays, I think, are just the best. I mean, they are so much better than the holidays I had when I was drinking, but I never would have imagined that before. Yeah, I agree. And um, it is one of those last stumbling blocks, I think, for a lot of people yeah. who are giving up alcohol because they have become so accustomed to having a free for all basically vacation or holiday meant it was okay to drink. It was socially acceptable to drink all day if you wanted. Yeah. And, and like it's funny how contradictory it is because we tell ourselves that or certainly I I used to tell myself that the reason I drank too much was because I was stressed. It was like, oh I'm mm -hmm. really busy, I'm really stressed. I use alcohol as a way of relaxing and I deserve it. But then you go on holiday when you're not stressed. And you drink twice as much. And how can those, you know, how, how can those two things exist together? You know, we sort of, we drink alcohol to have, uh, to, um, you know, when we're feeling stressed, we feel, uh, drink alcohol when we're feeling relaxed. We drink alcohol when we want to celebrate. We drink when we want to commiserate. You know, it's, you end up using any old excuse just to, to drink more, or certainly that's what I did anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. And well, I mean, alcohol itself is just so effective at moving you towards pleasure and away from pain. And that's what we do to survive. Well, what, yeah, what, what it does is it numbs all mm -hmm. the negative emotions that, that you have to deal with as a part of everyday life. But what you don't realize is that when you numb all the bad stuff, you also numb all the good stuff. So you end up just spending your whole life numb, which given that we only have one life and it's it's shorter than we might often shorter than we might want it to be, spending spending the majority of it anesthetized or hung over is is a bit of a waste really when you think about it. Yeah, it's a waste when you're wasted. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. how old are your children now? I've been thinking about them and and how your relationship has changed and how you talk to them about drinking because they've they've got to all be obviously older because it's been seven years what yeah they're, they're teenagers now so mm -hmm. my oldest is 15 uh, my son is 15 nearly 16 and my youngest is 13 so you know so when I quit they were they were much younger my youngest was only six when I quit and mm -hmm. and I quit partly because of them, because I didn't want to be, I, I didn't want them to have a role model um, who taught them that adults need to have a 
need to to have alcohol in order to get through life. Um, I thought it, that was just a bad message to to give them, and and I was just conscious that I wasn't, you know, although I was with them a huge amount of time, I wasn't properly with them. I was, you know, I was always. I was often trying to run away and, you know, read bedtime stories as quickly as possible and get to the fridge to, to, uh, you know, to pour a glass of wine. And, and you know what motherhood is like. It's gone so quickly and I'm wishing it away, which is what I was doing. I was spending the whole time thinking I want to get through this as quickly as possible so I can have time to myself, me time. Um, and, and that's just such a shame when, when they're young for such a short period of time. And so how do you talk about to your kids about drinking now that they're at that age where they experiment and they're becoming legal age? Yeah, I mean, alcohol, it's legal to drink alcohol in the UK at 18. So okay. my daughter is, uh, my eldest, uh, you know, is already at the age where alcohol is, is at all the parties she goes to. Um, and... I don't think it's realistic to tell teenagers they can't drink because apart from anything else, teenagers don't listen to what their mm -hmm. parents tell them like that. And you're, you know, all that will happen is they'll drink secretly and not tell you about it if you mm -hmm. try and ban them from drinking. So you can't do that. And and the reality is 80% of adults still drink alcohol. So um, so it's unrealistic, I I think, to tell them they shouldn't drink. Um, but what I do is I give them parameters and say, look, if you want to be able to drink responsibly and moderately um, for the rest of your life and not end up in the position that I did, then you need to keep your drinking within sensible parameters. And the parameters that I give them are, um, I say that um, they should never drink alone ever. And that was one of the big mistakes that I made. Um, so only ever drink in company. Um, don't drink more than three drinks in any one sitting um, and don't drink more than three nights in any one week. And, and I say to them, look, does that seem reasonable? And they go, oh yeah, yeah, that seems perfectly reasonable. And I say, well, there may come a day when you start making excuses to break those rules and those rules don't seem reasonable to you anymore. And that's the point where you have to start worrying and thinking you know there is that is my addict brain talking to me because my non-addict brain knew that those rules were fine and it's my addict brain that's telling me that those rules aren't fine and therefore I need to start worrying so so that's that's the conversation that I have with my kids yeah I, I agree that it's not realistic to expect that they're not going to drink or experiment and you know, I do like emphasize my history and that um, I just also want them to be safe as far as mm -hmm. driving and, and being in situations with other people or, you know, I have two girls, so I want them to be safe. Well, thank you for sharing about your children. Oh, that's, that's, that's quite all right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they, they uh, it's, it's funny, they, um, they, they, uh, have got to the age where they don't like me um, telling stories about them anymore. So, so I can't. I never go into too much detail about my <laughs> my kids. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm not allowed to post pictures of them on on social media or anything. It's sort of boundaries, mummy. <laughs> oh, mine are the same. They are the same. Um. Well, okay. So sober diaries. It's a lot about like getting sober in that first year of sobriety. And so I'm wondering what your advice is for staying sober in the long term now that you're seven years. Oh, uh, you know what? When I first quit drinking, I thought that all the big changes happened in the first sort of three months. And mm -hmm. then that was it. You were sort of done. Um, and I now realize that the process of getting sober takes, you know, takes a long time. It, those changes keep coming. And life actually gets better and better over over the following years not just months so so i i found that the first year was all about looking inwards it's all about 
working out who you are without alcohol, how you cope with life without alcohol, what you do instead of drinking alcohol, all those things. And it's really hard work. It feels a bit like peeling off the layers and then you have to rebuild yourself back up again. It's, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. Um, and then you get to the second year and what most people end up doing is they think, OK, I've, you know, I've done that and I feel really much more energetic, much stronger, uh, much more um, positive, um, and I've got all this time, and what am I going to do with it? And often the second year is about focusing outwards, you know, what, what do I do next? And for me, it was writing, writing, but, you know, filled the hole that alcohol left, and it was my childhood passion, which I sort of rediscovered, and often what people fill the hole with is something that they were passionate about passionate about when they were a child it's really interesting whether it was sort of you know riding horses or art or music or writing or you know it's it's often often the clue to to how you can reinvent yourself lies with those those childhood passions um, so uh you know in terms of how you stay sober um i think it's about um it's about finding something to fill the gap with which i don't think you should worry about initially that is really something to focus on in year two um rather than panicking about what it is in year one um, but it's also about staying connected it's about staying connected with the sober community and reminding yourself why you're doing what you're doing and Alcoholics Anonymous actually call it, um, it's the 12th step of the 12 steps, is, is, which is giving back. And they say that in order to stay sober, you need to give back to the community. And, and I think that's very true because not only because it makes, it makes you, it's good karma, you know, it makes <laughs> you feel good about yourself and it's the right thing to do. But also because it does remind you why why you don't want to drink anymore. You know, every time you talk to somebody who's newly sober, you think, God, I remember what that felt like now. And I don't ever want to go back there. And and that reminder is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I've like, you do see a lot of people pivot in their careers after giving up drinking um, and finding their passion and then finding meaning in helping other people. Mm. I love that. Uh, so I, one of my, I was going to say reader, but listeners, <laughs> um, she really loves your book and she loves your description of the obstacle course. And that was where you go over basically the hard part of quitting and doing the first few days over and over again. And she was wondering how you came up with that story. She said it's really spot on and a really creative way to explain being stuck. Oh, that's lovely to hear. I mean, yeah. it's, that blog post, the, ob it, the obstacle course, which mm -hmm. I've then re reprinted in, in, the, in the Sober Diaries, um, has been shared thousands and thousands of times since I, I wrote it. So nearly, you know, six and a half years ago, I wrote that post. And it's, it's, uh, it's still constantly shared on the on the internet which is amazing and um i think i wrote it when i was about seven months sober and i just had this i i was following a lot of other sober bloggers um and there were some who i'd follow who i followed since i quit drinking myself and i was seven months sober and they were back at day one or day seven or day 14 and they kept getting a few weeks under their belts and then starting all over again and I was just trying to work out how I could explain to them why why I found that really sad and really frustrating and and I what, what I figured is that the problem is that the first few weeks of quitting are the hardest. You know, the first, you know, anyone who's quit for, for dry January knows that the, the first four weeks are really tough, mm -hmm. but the really good bits don't kick in until about 100 days. So 
if you only do two weeks and then start drinking again, and then you do three weeks and start drinking again, and then you do four weeks and start drinking again, you're doing that hard bit of the journey again and again and again, and you haven't yet got to the good bit. And that's why I came up with this analogy to try and explain that, which was about um, the obstacle course. And, and what I said is that I felt like I had been living in this field, which was once beautiful and filled with fresh flowers and bunnies and, and rainbows and what have you. And over the years, it had got more and more miserable, but it had happened so gradually, I'd hardly noticed it. So it started getting, the weather got worse, it was rainier and the flowers died and it got colder and colder. And I talked to people who said, you know, there's another field some distance away, which is just like the field you used to be in. It's really beautiful. And there are lots of bunnies and fresh flowers and, and um, you know, beautiful music. And, and there's, there's lots of people there who are really happy and you should go there. But in order to get there, you have to go over this really tough obstacle course. And, and uh, you think initially, yeah, I can do that. And you throw yourself at the first obstacle and you go over the sort of six foot wall and the leech infested ditch. And, you know, you uh, and then you you start getting more and more tired and you think, I don't know how long it takes to get to the other end of this obstacle course. And I don't know whether that field actually even exists. And where I was was miserable, but it's not as miserable as this obstacle course is. <laughs> And so what you do is you go back, you go back to your field and you think, God, I'm glad I'm back here. But before long, you again, you know, you're wet, you're cold, you're miserable and you throw yourself at the obstacle course again. And you go, oh, you know, this happens again and again and again until somebody says to you, look, you have to keep going. It only takes 100 days and you will get to that other field. You will get there and it will be amazing. Um, and eventually you keep going through the whole obstacle course over all the obstacles, which get easier and easier and easier and further and further apart until you end up in the field of bunnies and people share little bunny emojis on social media all the time, which is really cute um, and say, yeah, that field really does exist and you really can get it there. You just have to get over those obstacles and it takes about a hundred days. And once you're there, life will get better and better and better. Oh, I just love that. That was like bringing tears to my eyes. I thank you for explaining that again. Um, and your words are just so beautiful. And that imagery is just, I think it gives a lot of people hope. But that's how it feels, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you sort of, you know that where you are isn't right and it's getting worse and yeah. worse. The journey to get somewhere else seems so hard. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, know how long it's going to take and you don't know if the place you're going to get to is worth getting to anyway it's really difficult to keep going so you know so that really is that's exactly how it felt to me yeah I, I think to a lot of people too uh, that's why it's so shared so often it's just wonderful thank you I was listening to your TED talk about shame and mm -hmm. I I loved how you started it and you told your story of how you were diagnosed with breast cancer in that first year of getting sober and you told everyone that you had breast cancer. You told the checkout lady like you were so open <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah. Um but you told no one that you were sober or quitting drinking mm -hmm. or I, and I just thought, wow, you know, you, you wrote your blog in secret. Um, it, it was, you know, it took you some time to really recover out loud. And I was wondering if you yeah. could speak to that. Yeah. You know, I, I think the world was slightly different seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I like to think that it's easier for people to, admit to to quitting drinking um, now than than it was back then but back then you know I felt that when you quit smoking which I'd done so sort of, god 20 years previously um, everyone goes yay well done you you're so strong and brave and clever and that's a really great thing to do and you quit drinking and people think you're a bit strange and they think that 
you know, they 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 typecast you and they imagine all sorts of stuff about you and they feel uncomfortable around you. And, you know, as a result, I I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell anyone. I felt really ashamed. I felt like it was my fault. And I felt like I was the only person who was in this mess. And I didn't think anyone would understand and I didn't think anyone would want to be my friend without me drinking. I mean, I, all these things that now I look back and I think, God, why, why did I believe all of that? But I really did. Um, so it took me, it took me about a year before I started telling people that I wasn't drinking anymore. I, I used to fake drink. I'd go to parties and, <laughs> and hold a drink that looked like it might have alcohol in but didn't um and I'd have go to dinner parties and let people pour me a glass of wine I just wouldn't drink it I'd sit there with it in front of me and not touch it which was a ridiculous thing to do really um yeah so so it's it's crazy how to me now how how obsessed I was by you know by you know not people not knowing mm-hmm yeah, and I I want to thank you because I feel like your story um and your your memoir and you recovering out loud has really led the way for a lot of other people to recover out loud. Oh, I I hope so because you know what we and what I say at the end of the the TED talk which is uh, called making sober less shameful is that that really what we should feel so proud of ourselves you know giving Mm -hmm. giving up alcohol is a really positive choice to make for your life and the life of the people that care about you and the people that you care for so feeling ashamed about it is is a really stupid thing to do you know we should be really proud of ourselves and if you know anyone who has quit drinking you should pat them on the back and tell them how brilliant they are because they are. And if, if you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is one of the, the best things you can, you can do for yourself. Um, so, and I think that's, that's becoming, that's becoming more and more accepted as, you know, that, that you don't give just, if you quit drinking, it doesn't mean necessarily that you had to quit is that you chose to quit and and that's a very different thing it's a positive choice and not something that you are forced to do because you have to which is the way that people always generally used to see it yeah it's become more of like a wellness choice it's it's Mm. the new wellness revolution yeah and social media really helps with that because You know, back when I started blogging, everybody like me was anonymous. We all blogged anonymously. And now um, people, you know, there's a massive sober community on Instagram and Mm -hmm. everyone is out there with their real names and their real faces, you know, talking about how wonderful their, their lives are. And it's all, you know, it feels like a much more open, enthusiastic, positive space than it used to be where it was sort of... and. I, th- I think the branding of, and again, it's something I talk about in the TED talk, but the branding of of sober um, is was a real issue. You know, when it's all about having to be anonymous and it's about mm-hmm. disease and it's about recovery and, you know, it's all this, um, you know, the word alcoholic, I think, is loaded with shame and mm-hmm. with stereotypes. And, you know, we need to change all of that. And like you, you know, you don't say, you know, hi, I'm Debbie, I'm an alcoholic. You say, I'm Debbie and I'm an alcohol-free badass. And that's a very Mm -hmm. (laughs) different message. And that's the one I think we should be embracing. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm a nurse in um, corporate health and wellness. And I really try to advocate more for the health side of things and educate, like, the medical community doesn't use the term alcoholic. I mean, it's alcohol use disorder and it's on a spectrum mm-hmm. from mild to severe. And I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not so black and white. 
Yeah, and the, people always used to see it as very, I mean, I certainly saw it as black and white, which was a real issue because mm-hmm. I used to spend the whole time Googling, am I an alcoholic? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if I managed to convince myself by asking one of those, answering one of those little questionnaires that pops up when you Google, am I an alcoholic? If I managed to convince myself that I wasn't an alcoholic because I didn't drink before midday and I didn't black out or whatever, I'd find some reason. I didn't drink spirits, you know, so I think, oh, no, I'm not a proper alcoholic. Therefore, I must be OK. And it's that's not the case because, you know, we're asking ourselves the wrong question because, as you say, it's a spectrum. And just because you're not at the far right hand end of the spectrum doesn't mean you're not in a bad place on that spectrum. And the question we should be asking isn't, am I an alcoholic? It's, is alcohol messing up my life and would I be happier without it? And if the answer to that question is yes, then then you should quit, uh, regardless of whether you fit into a a silly box and, um, you know, with a, with a, with a, uh, you know, with a title. Yeah. Well, you mentioned like seven years, just seven years ago like how much it's changed and how it's becoming more socially accepted to be alcohol free. Um, What other changes have you seen? Like, have you seen changes in mommy drinking culture? Um, Oh, uh, I, I think the mommy drinking culture, I still think is, is an issue Mm -hmm. and it might be getting a bit better, but, it's still social media is still filled with memes about you know if you just look at the pandemic how many things did you see crop up saying you know order more wine you know we need more alcohol in order to get through homeschooling and you know there were it alcohol was proffered and you know still is proffered as the um as the antidote to motherhood you know as as if as if it's, you know, motherhood is a trauma that we have to go through and alcohol is the anesthetic that, that you know, prevents you you hurting. And I, I think that's a really, it's a bad message to give mums and it's a bad message to give their kids. You know, the, mm. what we're saying to, to our kids is mummy can't cope with you unless she's got wine on the side. Um, and that's a really, that's, that's a really sad thing to say to our children. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I feel in a way like it's our sort of feminist duty to turn around and say, look, enough of this, enough of trying to feed us this sort of, you know, this nonsense. You know, we are able to cope. We are better able to cope without it. And, you know, stop pushing alcohol on us as some sort of catch all for for any any problems that we might be going through. Yeah, the pandemic really threw a curveball at the progress that was being made in drinking and changing drinking. Yeah, I, I think I think it did, and I think there's a lot of people who've come out the other end of the pandemic and thought, "Oh God, I, I actually, I'm, you know, I, I'm not sure that my alcohol use is is in control any longer." Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, if you're if any of those people are listening, just know that you are not alone and and that there is a huge amount of help out there. Um, and uh, and you can uh, you you know you really can turn your life around. So, you know, if I if I'd still been drinking during the pandemic, I would have thrown out all the toilet paper and all the pasta and all the emergency supplies in the cupboards and filled it with wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am very glad that I quit before the pandemic. Um, and I feel very sorry for the, you know, those people that didn't. Yeah, I, absolutely. Well, what would some of your other top tips be for anyone looking to change their relationship with alcohol? Um, uh, I, I would say write it down because where I've, if you, a few months after you quit drinking, it's very easy to forget how bad it was. And it's very easy for that little voice in your head to go, Oh, um, you know, you're, you're fine now. You haven't had a drink for six months. You are sort of, you know, you've reset the, the, uh, you know, you've recalibrated yourself and you know, you're much older and wiser and you know better now and you'll never get in that situation again. And why don't you just have a drink or two? And it's really important to write down how you feel now. You know, what are the reasons why you want to quit? All the really messy, nasty, horrible stuff that you don't want to think about. Write it all down so you've got something you can look back on when you forget. 
because our brains are very good at wiping out negative experiences as much as they can and having something written down to remind yourself why you're doing this is, is a really helpful thing to do um, and then find yourself a community and in the old days Alcoholics Anonymous was all there was and they are a brilliant organization that do amazing things but they're not for everyone and now there is so much choice, um, particularly with the internet. You don't have to go and meet people in real life if you don't want to or you can't. There are so many groups online. There are Facebook groups. There are There's the Instagram sober community. There are lots of, of, um, of uh, communities in real life and on the internet that you can you can join. So just find find a space where there are people like you who make you feel comfortable. And, and it's really, it is, so much easier to do this with with other people alongside you and uh, they say that the opposite of, of addiction is connection and that that's so true um and uh yeah so find your tribe and and the the other thing probably the most important thing is it's all about mindset so instead of thinking uh, even just when we talk about giving up alcohol we're not giving up anything we're actually embracing a whole new life. So try not to think about it as giving up and what you're losing, what you're missing. Think about what you're gaining. And I always tell people, make a little mood board, do a sort of vision board, which shows what you want your life to look like when it doesn't have any alcohol in it. And put that on the fridge or next to your bed or something where you see it every day and it just reminds you where you want to be. And you'll get there. You really will get there. And one day you'll look at that board and you'll think, oh my God, that's me. And that is my life. I I love that you said all those things. I was reflecting back on, you, you mentioned community and connection. And I was thinking about your obstacle course and like, you, we can help each other over that obstacle course. It's easier yeah. with someone. Exactly. And you, you need people in the field you're heading to who are shouting back to you saying yeah. I'm here and you can get here too and it really does exist and this is what it looks like yeah um, and you need people who are in the old field going I really want to be where you are halfway down that obstacle course because I'm still stuck here in this field and it's getting worse and worse you know so and, and then you want the person right alongside you who's saying, look, we're both halfway there and we can both get there if we can help each other over this damn wall. So, um, yeah, you're quite right. It's, uh, you know, those it's those people you need alongside you. Yeah, I love that. Well, um, tell me about your new book. Oh, I'm yeah. excited. I really liked um, the author's. I, I'm, I have a hard time saying it though, Claire, the authenticity <laughs> project. <laughs> that was a really special, it's a fiction book. It's a novel. I, I was just like, oh my gosh, she wrote a novel because it was funny. Because my sister and my mom and I all read. We're very avid readers and book nerds. And so my sister and I had a friend from work tell me about this book. And I'm like, wait, Claire Pooley, I love her sober diary. Like she wrote, to me, it was just like so inspiring. I was just so proud of you and for you, you that you like well, crossed never, over to that world. Well, I never could have written a novel while I was still drinking, partly because mm -hmm. the time I used to write the novel is the time when I would have been lying in bed feeling miserable <laughs> about life rather than totally. getting up at 5 a.m. and writing. Um, and uh, also because, you know, it's my, it, I, I really started writing as a form of therapy and, and I just kept going and it's now, and I love it so much that, you know, once I had written about my own life, I thought, I actually, I want to carry on writing, but I want to write about other people. I want to write about, and I, so I invented people to write about instead. Um, but the Authenticity Project was, very much inspired by my own experience because it's all about what happens when you tell the real truth yeah. about your life. And there's an addict in it, obviously, and his name is Hazard and he's an alcohol and cocaine addict. So, so I do explore addiction through him. Um, and, uh, which again, I found very therapeutic. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I love writing that book. Um, and now I've, uh, I'm about to publish a second novel, which, 
comes out at the end of the May, May in the UK and is called The People on Platform 5. And in the US, it's out at the beginning of June and it's called Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting. So it has okay. two different titles, it's slightly <laughs> confusing. But if you're listening to this in the US, it's called Iona Iverson's Rules for Commuting. And it's about, it's about a group of people who meet on a commuter train. You know, they see each other over and over again and they give each other little nicknames and they make assumptions about each other, but they never speak because people on trains don't talk to each other, or at least they don't in London, um, which is where it's set. Um, and then one day, one of them chokes on a grape and nearly dies. And one of the others gives him the Heimlich maneuver and saves his life. And that sort of, that that incident, um, you know, the the grape incident gets these people talking and and the book is all about what happens next and what happens. So all the amazing, con- you know, what those sorts of connections with strangers who are ostensibly completely different from each other um, can, uh, what magic happens when when they they start they start getting to know each other. Oh, that sounds good. I'm looking forward to reading that. And then what are your other plans for your future? Oh, (laughs) Um, you know, it's funny, actually, what I've learned, I think, through this whole experience is that when you quit drinking, you you become more in tune with your gut instinct. Um, So you're more able to read yourself and what you what is good for you, what isn't good for you um, and, you know, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So, you know, what I found since I quit drinking is that if you're open to opportunities, then they tend to come along. And once you quit drinking, you gain courage and bravery and you're more able to take those opportunities because you think, well, hell, I've done come this far, you know, I'll just give it a go. What's the worst thing that can happen? So to answer your question, you know, I'm just going to see what comes up. I'm carrying on writing because I love it. So I'm I'm now talking to my publishers about a third book. Um, but uh, but I'm sort of open to opportunities, and and I just believe that that you know when something will come along, and if it's right, I'll grab it. And I I'm interested to see what that is. You're open. You're, I, you know, I like that you brought that up. Like when you quit drinking and you go through such a big transformation, it does seem like you can do anything. Like there is a mm-hmm. lot of confidence there, and you've gone through such a um a difficult part of your life that it does make the rest of your life easier. Yeah, and you realize that all the tools that you learn when you quit drinking are really helpful Mm -hmm. for other things. So, for instance, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, I realized that, you know, the things that I'd learned when I was going sober, like taking one day at a time, uh, using, you know, finding things, different things, a thing in my toolbox to keep myself distracted and cope with cravings and not looking too far ahead. All of those things were really helpful when it came to getting through all the cancer treatment it was exactly the same process sort of reapplied and once you've done that a couple of times with different things you sort of think okay throw it at me you know I I you know I I know I can deal with this stuff now um I don't want to have to deal with it but if it gets thrown at me I know I can deal with it and and you know there is there's not much that is as hard as what you've just been through so you know so it does make you feel more courageous and it makes you feel more able to you know I used to I used to turn down opportunities regularly because I was worried that I'd fail and the only way I realize now that the only surefire way of failing is not to even try (laughs) Mm -hmm. ah thank you wow well how can people find you what's the best way to find Claire Pooley Oh, um, social media. So, so uh, Facebook. Um, I have a Facebook page called Sober Mummy, um, and uh, I'm on Instagram as at Claire underscore Pooley, and I'm on Twitter at C Pooley Writer. Um, so, uh, so any of those places. I also have a website which is ClarePooley dot com, um, and Claire doesn't have an I in it um, in my name. So, <laughs> so ClarePooley without an I dot com. 
Perfect. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story and your wisdom. This was just everything I expected and more. So I, I really am grateful for you. And it's wonderful to meet you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. And, um, and I really enjoyed chatting to you. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Alcohol Tipping Point. I'm always here for you guys. So please feel free to reach out and talk to me on Instagram at Alcohol Tipping Point and check out my website, alcoholtippingpoint.com. Again, I hope you can use these tips we talked about for the rest of your week. And until then, see you next time. Thank you.